One of the big social changes that emerges out of the Industrial Revolution was literacy. But importantly out of that as well is there is a de-skilling of certain jobs. We talk about things like technological unemployment, which is where jobs are taken away because technology has come in and replaced those people. That would be the case here in the Industrial Revolution, and particularly when we talk about things such as the de-skilling of trades, that would be it. But there's also this really interesting paradox where there is an increase of certain high skills, such as literacy. And the reason for that is largely because different roles emerge. For the working class, the, the trades people, they lose trades, right? Uh, millers and, um, and fabric producers or sort of middle industrial people are losing their skills. It's no longer a trade to be a miller or uh, a weaver. There, that can be done by a factory or an industry. But for the middle managing folk, there are skills that need to be happening. Uh, right, you need to know how to read, whether that's for the manuals that are there to, to be produced, or whether that's uh, you know simple arithmetic so that you can keep books. Whatever the case may be, skills are increasing. So throughout this period, there is an increase in literacy, but really in urban environments. As you will see, there's a huge divide between urban spaces and rural uh, and, and urban spaces and rural spaces. Because in an urban environment where there are more factory jobs and increased um, opportunity, more people know need to learn how to read. And what you get as an impact of that is skyrocketing skyrocketing literacy rates in urban environments and either stagnant or decreasing literacy rates in other environments because well decreasing because people are leaving and going you know educated folk are going to cities for more opportunity so what you have here are uh, really interesting so uh, male population again there would be less data for women um, just because there is uh, there would be sort of less managing roles for women uh, because of social and gender discrimination uh, in the 19th century. So for males, there's about 50% of the people who can learn, who read, read versus read and write, right, uh, in this period. And urban environments have a 10% higher, of, of that 51%, urban environments have 10% more uh, people who can do that. Uh, people who can read, again, rural, you have a higher percentage uh, because uh, you need people who can, you know, because educated people there would be people like your clergy and things like that, uh, where it may not be entirely important. Uh, but your illiteracy rate is very high, right? People who don't know how to read. For females, it would be the same thing. Uh, again, but we don't have data based on urban versus rural. But anyway. The other piece to this, and there's sort of two sides I would like to look at here, right? Illiteracy, illiteracy rates in urban environments and as we move more rural, right? So you have Devon, Durham, Hampshire, Middlesex, and Warwick and Worcester counties. This map is tougher to look at here, right? But Devon is here, Hampshire is here, um, Bucks County, which it was another place, Worcester, right? These are different urban environments where you have larger populations. But if you look again at, you know, even let's say 25% illiteracy rates, right? So 75% of the population is literate. Tough way to think of that, right? The places sort of right around London are in here, right? So you have Berks, Surrey. Somerset, right? Surrey, Bucks, 
you have all of these sort of counties surrounding London being very literate while, you know, Hunts County is the least literate and Hunts County is pretty, uh, pretty rural. So you can see here that you have very different literacy rates based on urban environments versus rural environments. And that also comes in here too, right? When we talk about lit illiteracy rates, right? When we look at skilled versus unskilled work or semi-skilled work, skilled workers, so these would be people like your, your lawyers, your doctors, you know, your middle managers, people who are drawing up contracts, their illiteracy rate is 19%. So 81% of the population having those jobs know how to read or write. Whereas, you know, semi-skilled or unskilled, you're talking about huge numbers of illiteracy. 30, 35% of the unskilled workers are illiterate. 30%, 29% are illiterate. And that's the same is true if you go after 1815 into our Victorian period. So what you can see here is there are huge disparities in literacy rates versus skilled and unskilled people, but you also have it on a rural versus urban divide. And when we couple that with the growth of the population, that even makes things more dramatic, right? Because cities like Birmingham, Leeds, Liverpool, and Manchester explode in population during our period. So if you look at those four cities in the pre-Victorian uh, period, you have relatively small populations. But if you look 90 years into the future, coming towards the end of our Victorian age, you have massive urban growth, right? Birmingham becoming, uh, you know, 500,000 plus people. Leeds, you know, 400,000. Liverpool growing by nine times, right, to seven over 700,000 people. So you have these huge growths in population. But what doesn't change here are, um, uh, are the ways in which people are represented. What doesn't happen here are better living conditions or ways people are represented, right? So population growth uh, expands, right? So, you know, in, in the late 1700s, 1800, early 1800s, and then into 1900, right? No place is really that urban. But then when you get further along, right, so you have this is Cardiff and Wales, London, obviously, Manchester, uh, Liverpool, right? You have all of these different urban environments in Scotland, right? All of these growing populations. Disease is, gr is spreading quickly, and we'll talk more about that uh, in, a, in a future lecture. You also have the growth of things called company towns. And company towns are developments that are made, as the name would suggest, by companies in order to protect the people and, and, and have the, the folks who are working for you live close by. So this uh, image here is a, um, uh, is a picture of Glasgow in Scotland. And this is uh, an image on the right hand side of, of developed towns, right, where uh, you know, very sort of block housing, uh, conveniently located, close to the jobs. But this is also a place where a lot of control is exerted over the people's lives. Uh, so urban environments are becoming places where people can easily live near their jobs, but it's also a place where uh, jobs can exert a lot of control over people because you pay your rent to the company because the company owns your home. Um, so it's, it's a tough situation. But as a result of that, you also have a really good, you know, some good outcomes, right? So in a comparison, right, uh, you have New Lanark, which is in Scotland, uh, starting in this, you know, in the early 1800s, run by a guy named Robert Owen. And this environment is a place where people are treated very well. Children are provided free education. Physicians are hired to take care of people. Um, and it's a way for people to improve their lives. Uh, the homes in which people are living, right, they're renting them from the company, but the homes are quite good. They are multi-room homes with, um, 
good ventilation, better resources for people. Again, these are ways to make people's lives better. And if you lived in sort of any other an urban environment in this period, you would not have a multi-room home. You're probably having a one room, maybe two room building uh, apartment where you are sharing beds with you know, your entire family. It's getting very dirty and cramped. That would not be the case in, in New Lanark. In the bad side, you have the Lever Brothers, right? This it's a soap and tallow factory. They also have homes for the people, right? But what this is trying to do is trying to train people. We call this sometimes paternalism in action, uh, basically trying to improve people's lives through indoctrination. Uh, they would be forced to religious observances. If you weren't in, in services on the weekend, you would uh, you know you have to be talked talk to by your manager. Um, this is a way, uh, again, pubs would be closed at certain times, again, to, to enforce sobriety. All of these things are changing the way people expect to be treated. In urban environments, you have the growing radicalism of people who are trying to fight against social class distinction. So one of the big things that happens here is the People's Charter. We'll talk more about that um, in, in uh, two lectures. But there's a desire to stop sort of voter suppression. Um, the People's Charter is sort of requesting new types and chartism itself, trying to change the way people viewed um, voting rights and voting representation. And sort of the greatest implication of that comes with the Great Reform Act of 1832. Now, the Great Reform Act of 1832 was not sort of a silver bullet to underrepresentation, but it does provide greater representation for the people of the United Kingdom. One of the things that existed before 1832 were what were called rotten boroughs. These establishments, these places, would be rural communities that once had a lot of power, maybe had the, the patronage of a, of a local landlord, and that would be um, represented by a, a member of parliament. But there may only be a handful of people who lived there uh, as urbanization is pushing people to the cities, as farm labor is becoming less, uh, less um, strenuous with the Industrial Revolution creating better yields and, and, and machinery to help with the, with the harvesting. You don't need as many people living on farms. So people are moving into urban environments, people are moving away from rural areas. So there, there are stories of, of rural, rural areas being, you know, having one MP for seven people, where in places like Manchester and Liverpool, you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and maybe the same number of MPs, members of parliament. So the Reform Bill of 1832 gets rid of 56 uh, rotten boroughs. It reduces 31 further boroughs to only one member of parliament. But what's significant here is it creates 67 new constituencies, 67 new areas where members of parliament will be put into place. What's important to see here that is happening during the Victorian era are two things. One, you have a huge growth in literacy, a huge change in the resources and the skills that average people have. Um, lawyers, doctors, managers, people who are going to be responsible for industry are becoming more literate. As a result, you're also having people who are doing unskilled work becoming or staying equally illiterate based on you know what it was before again if you looked back at that chart that i showed you a few moments ago you know unskilled workers really changed nearly unchanged uh stay nearly unchanged right the reduction of what 1.8 percent of illiteracy the other piece to this is there is going to be a growing issue between urban and rural environments Urban environments are going to continue to grow, become more um, democratic, pushing for those ideas, while 
rural environments are going to probably stay less. Good luck.